Hi, everybody. This is Joanne, Science Goddess on Twitter, and you are here for Read Science with myself and my co-host, Jeff Schomeyer, over there in DC. And uh, today we are joined by our guest, writer Marin McKenna, who is known, oh, I didn't bring your other book, who is well known for being the scary disease lady, um, <laughs> maybe not so much anymore. <laughs> and uh, she, she wrote a great book called Superbug, and you also wrote one called Beating Back the Devil. That's Sorry, right. I didn't read that one, but I read Superbug, I love <laughs> Superbug. But her book, why we're here today is because she just recently published a book called Big Chicken, uh, the incredible story of how antibiotics created modern agriculture and changed the way the world eats. And uh, Jeff can explain why it was such a page turner for him <laughs> that he forgot to take notes. Um, but I'm sure he will uh, definitely have still plenty of questions. Uh, Marin, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. You were so nice to Superbug, my previous book. I am really, really thrilled to be back here again. So thanks. Yay. Yay. So actually, I'm going to read your profile from your book. Oh, my <laughs> That's word. Okay. okay. We'll read your one. bio. From the short one, yeah. Um, so Marin McKenna is an award-winning journalist and author specializing in public health and food policy. Her work has appeared in all the places our guests tend to appear. National Geographic, The New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, Wired, Scientific American, and Slate, among other publications. Her 2015, 2015 TED Talk, uh, What Do We Do When Antibiotics Don't Work Anymore, has garnered more than one million views. McKenna is the author of two previous books, Superbug and Beating Back the Devil. And you live in Maine and Atlanta, Georgia. That's what I want to say. I want to get two places to live. <laughs> so the other place, uh, Atlanta is where I live most of the time when I'm not on the road. Uh, Maine is a hoped for um, cabin on my husband's family's land in the middle of not very much. That okay. sounds remarkably ideal. <laughs> we hope for a writer. Think, yeah. Good yeah. for a writer, I would think. I'm yeah. really looking forward Marin, to talking about Big Chicken because, as I said to you before we started, it was unexpectedly a page turner for me. And Joanne, I did remember to start taking notes around page 130. So there may be a gap early in the history. <laughs> and indeed, there's a lot of history we need to get through. When I got toward the end of this, of this book, in addition to writing in my notes, let chickens be chickens, I uh, I was interested to note this, this contrast where you wrote that in 2016, the UN declared antibiotic resistance the greatest and most urgent global risk. And it's serious and it's starting to <coughs> penetrate the public consciousness, I think. And I was also thinking about how younger generations often look at older generations and their grandparents and say, how could you have gotten us here? And I usually think rhetorically in my head, very often it was by a series of small steps that seemed like a good idea at the time. With all this history to go through, I wondered if we could recap some of those, so I have in mind a few that seemed like a good idea and only later got us to where we are so that we can get the big picture here that you detail so nicely. So what were chickens like? And you know, let's go back to chickens walking around and pecking back in the early part of the 20th century. So this goes back to the, the time of possibly the grandparents of some people who are At listening, least. maybe even their great grandparents. There was a point before World War II when just about everyone had chickens out the back door. Um, they were there primarily to produce eggs, to produce an inexpensive protein. And in fact, my mother's Sorry, my father <laughs> had a farm that he operated successfully and he had a coop of chickens in the barnyard that roamed right. around and pecked and things and that we had on Sundays for chicken dinner. So those chickens would have been primarily there in order to lay eggs and that imposes some um, sort of design constraints or evolutionary constraints, which is they would have been fairly um, sturdy birds because they lived primarily outdoors. They would have been adapted to eating a diet that they largely fed themselves of grubs and insects and things they scratched up and vegetation. In addition to feed, they would have been given by farmers. That was probably, at least to some degree, at least for smaller farmers, would have been more like food scraps than like um, the, the 
the grain based granular mm -hmm. feed that we're used to today. They were adapted to walking around and flapping up into trees and chasing after chicks. And the consequence of all of those, <clears throat> of all of, all of that evolutionary adaptation to that situation, is that they were pretty chewy. Yeah. They also would have been mostly dark feathered or at least red feathered. Because mm -hmm. when a hen has been chasing around for two years of her life, or around um, clutch after clutch of chicks, her, her flesh, once she gets to the point of being killed, when she's kind of out of eggs, when she's a spent hen, as they say, mm -hmm. her... Her flesh might have a great deal of flavor in it from being worked so much and having so much circulation going through it, but it probably isn't very abundant. <laughs> and um, it's probably pretty tough from getting all that exercise. So for the most part, before chicken became industrialized, um, chickens were things that were not really very delicious, uh, mm -hmm. except in the case of baby roosters, which, you know, if you're going to keep a flock of chickens and you want the, the eggs to be fertilized, you need one rooster, but you probably don't need very many more, and they'll mm -hmm. fight if you have them. So um, a, a thing came about in the 30s where farmers would feed up the excess roosters and sell them young mm -hmm. before their secondary sexual characteristics were fully uh, uh, explicit. and um, and those are what, in old restaurant menus, you can see as spring chickens, mm -hmm. as in they were born in the first clutch in the spring. Mm -hmm. So the problem with those, with the hens, with backyard hens or small farm hens, um, was that they, you know, they they were upright and skinny and not very well muscled. They didn't actually have a lot of flesh on them, and that flesh would have been not super delicious to eat. Um, and so, as chicken chickens became the industry of chicken. Chicken in a number of uh, the chicken industry in a number of ways had to change birds conformation really as as well as the the speed and reliability with which they were produced in order to make them uh, a consistent and tasty crop would have had a lot of varieties there were a lot of different <clears throat> varieties of chickens that were raised at the time too weren't there that's right in fact some in one of the chapters in the book I talk about a guy whom I just adore uh, his name is Frank Reese. He's, I think of him as kind of a priest of chicken, and he oh, lives yeah. by himself in the middle Kansas. of nowhere, Kansas. Um, I love that farm, yeah. He, uh, he has devoted his life to maintaining what we would probably call standard bread or heritage birds, but mm -hmm. birds of all shapes and colors and conformation that are not just free range around his barn and, and farm, but like totally own his farm. It, he just happens to live there. And he does this because for some inexplicable reason, he just feels a really deep emotional co connection to poultry, to chickens and turkeys. But and he, also... He lives, he lives remotely for reasons that we'll probably get to. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he thinks that, um, that the industry will someday want again mm -hmm. the genetics that his birds represent, which are genetics that were rejected mm -hmm. when chicken was turned from an individual backyard crop into a large industrial crop and the genetics of chicken were um, hybridized and standardized and yeah. essentially became intellectual property. You know, I think of him when I read that, the first thing <clears throat> I thought of is he's like the uh, Svalbard seed bank of chickens. He right? is, in fact, he's a seed saver of chicken. That's right, yeah. 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 A seed, and crucially, a seed saver of open source, source. genetics. Yeah. Exactly. These are the, the heritage genetics that you know are the inheritance of all of us, that, but that really are no longer present in the um, industrial scale chicken that we grow and eat today. You know, and actually one thing uh, that I was thinking when I, when I read your book, I was thinking of Rob Dunn's latest book, which is Never Out of Season, and just about the immense ecological consequences if all of our food supplies are of like mm. very minimal genetic lineage, you know, these, this is a recipe for genetic disaster, Just I guess, so to speak, in general, but also, you know, because of our food supplies. And that's what I thought. That's, that's one thing, that actually, that was my favorite chapter because I was like, oh, somebody's doing this. Thank you for telling me that somebody's doing this too, you know? He really is amazing. I have a little short film I made about him that I'm going to put up soon. Oh. Um, it's been a little busy the past week or two, but I have lovely, lovely pictures of him and all his chickens and all his turkeys and how they, you know, at the end of the day, they're all up in the trees and lining the roof ridge of his house and sitting on top of his truck. And um, uh, and they, the, tur the turkeys in particular are very talkative. And I think they know the word turkey because I walked up to them and um, and these are big, beautiful birds. I mean, you would not want to tangle with one of these birds or make them annoyed. 
I walked up to them and said, hello, turkeys. And they all went gobble, 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 gobble. <laughs> I said, that was interesting. And they didn't say anything. <laughs> so I said, <clears throat> is it possible that you know the word turkey? turkey? Gobble, 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 gobble. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's actually pretty good. So, so, so we, we talked about these, these things. So how did we get where we're having now our uh, standardized chicken, um, somewhat plain, you know, what, what the premise of this So book. the fascinating thing about this history is that chicken, poultry, poultry production turns out to be the source of and the product of really an, a really interesting rolling series of innovations, all yeah. of which, as Jeff said, seemed like good ideas at the time. At the time, and yeah, so I'm thinking about, <clears throat> since I live in Maryland, and we know about all those chicken things, chicken farms out on Delvara Peninsula when we drive to the, uh, to the Eastern Shore, then one of the next things that comes along is the rise of large chicken farming on the Delmarva Peninsula. Right, which right. was an accident by, I can't remember her name, who ordered, what, 50 chickens and got 500. Or and she was, she was ordering hens, so, right, so here's, so here's where these <laughs> innovations start. I'll back you up a little bit. Yeah. Really, the first innovation is that someone invents an electric incubator, which, is, uh, which allows farmers to take hens from having to brood their eggs, to sit yes. on the eggs to hatch them. So you don't lose several months of that hen's productivity to her sitting and being you know, not producing more generations because she's raising mom. the current one. Yeah. Then there's this, the uh, synthesizing of vitamins because right. until vitamins could be added to feed, farmers couldn't keep the chickens alive over the winter when they had to be closed away from the outdoors and the sunlight. So then you get um, a 12 month crop. Mm -hmm. Then comes the hero or villain of my story. Um, actually, maybe Cecile Steele comes before this. As so the person whom you just mentioned, Mrs. Wilmer Steele of uh, Ocean View, Delaware, who is an egg farmer, uh, mm -hmm. but gets, accidentally gets too many chicks for the next generation <laughs> yes. of hens on her farm. And instead of 50, she gets 500, and she doesn't want 500 laying hens, so she decides <laughs> to raise them, to feed them, and raise them as meat chickens, which no one would have done to that point because hens' mm -hmm. ability to lay eggs was more valuable because for reasons we'll get to, chicken was not yet considered that desirable a food. So <clears throat> she grows them up, she kills them young, she establishes a market for them, primarily in New York City, which becomes a, a center of chicken consumption because of the very large Jewish population. Because mm -hmm. at that point, Americans' favorite meat is beef. Yeah. Um, now our favorite meat is chicken, um, but uh, of course, you know, so Jews are looking for a tasty Sabbath meal, something celebratory, and they can't eat pork for obvious reasons. And um, they are unlikely to eat beef at that time among um, very orthodox communities because there's no way that kosher slaughter ha can be guaranteed because the cows aren't being killed in front of them. Right. But chickens are small enough and portable enough that you can bring them into the city live and kill them in front of the customer. And, and our, so ritual and slaughter parents, is... Or my grandparents farm it was something of a special meal already there was a an aura of it being a special event to have a chicken right so for Jews this would be uh, the Sabbath meal on Friday for Gentiles it would be Sunday lunch right mm -hmm. that you that we would have chicken as a special thing exactly. but there still isn't that much availability of chicken and that's where the hero or villain of the story enters <laughs> Thomas Jukes mm -hmm. a chemist a specialist in the dietary needs of chicken who happens to be working for one of the companies that start the antibiotic era. His company, Letterly Laboratories, part of the, the post-war company American Cyanamid, mm -hmm. make chlorotetracycline, or the trade name is oreomycin. That's one of the four drugs that starts the antibiotic era in the late 1940s. Right. And Jukes has this idea that maybe oreomycin is going to be good for more than just curing infections in people. And almost immediately after it is patented for use as a human medication, he goes looking for another use for it and he trials uh, <laughs> the, the, actually the manufacturing waste of oreomycin as yeah. a supplement to the diets of chickens. And yeah. the chickens that get the manufacturing waste, which is essentially a sticky mass of exhausted organisms with some trace amounts of antibiotic in it, mm -hmm. 
gain three times as much weight as his control chickens. And startling. suddenly it becomes possible to, to vastly increase the supply of chicken. So that's another one of those amazing innovations. But then the industry has to deal with supply is getting out in front of us. How but do he, we increase demand? He traces that down to an interesting <clears throat> thing that it ended up being, he determined the trace amounts of the antibiotic and not the, uh, the waste product. Right. That was That's the right. active agent. And so he discovers this almost homeopathic idea that tiny amounts of antibody cause have an extraordinary to expand. Right. Perturbation of what we would now call perturbation of the gut microbiome. Yeah. Right. But yeah. they had did not have that understanding back mm -hmm. then. In fact, you know, I, I read a lot of the the papers from the 40s and 50s. There's, there's a very, very long bibliography in this book yes. uh, <laughs> uh, in which they attempted to figure out what was going on. And to give them Why? some credit, they did try. But they mm -hmm. just didn't have the molecular tools then mm -hmm. to really understand it in the way that we do now. It's a startling result. And you, you make me think as you're talking about food and things. And I've read some interesting books about uh, the rise of the scientific kitchen mm. and how at the similar time, technology was seen as <clears throat> sterile and healthful and all good things, you know, so we get sliced white bread as a step up rather than, you know, the, the low life step down that Oh, th this routine of today. antibiotics to, to, to livestock, which takes off really fast from within five years of Jukes's discovery, mm -hmm. U.S. farmers are feeding livestock 500,000 pounds of antibiotics a year. And now it's 34 million pounds a year, according <laughs> to the most recent federal data. But it is, an, in their point of view, it's not an unqualified good. It's part of that post-war, you know, post-war pre-Sputnik Mm -hmm. uncomplicated belief in science mm -hmm. as as bringing only gifts to man that yeah. that's this is the era of better living through chemistry yes right? yes right. okay and then then we have <laughs> um, I can't remember the names very well but we have vertical integration is the next thing I'm thinking of in Georgia right right another another innovation so a feed dealer from a very poor family named Jesse du Jewel Jesse Dixon mm -hmm. Jewel um, his, he comes from the, the, the very unproductive hills of northeast Georgia, which are, have been completely unable to catch a break since the Civil War. And the, so you mentioned Cecile Steele and Delmarva and how the Delmarva Peninsula became a center for chicken raising. Well, the thing about Delmarva, if you've ever been there, mm -hmm. there's only one road in and out, pretty mm -hmm. much, maybe two. <laughs> So when at the, at, at the beginning of World War II, when suddenly there was this vast spool up in military personnel being sent yes. all over the world, the US government looked around for ways to feed the troops efficiently and looked at Delmarva and said, right then, we are nationalizing your chicken production. Mm -hmm. They just, they made themselves the sole customer of Delmarva. Too successful. Another case of, in a way, small perturbations that lead to very large right, right. effects. So since Delmarva, which has been feeding the New York City chicken market, is suddenly taken out of the equation, that gives uh, a boost to other places that are starting to grow chickens, which is Northeast Georgia, and also Arkansas, which will later be the, birth, the birthplace of Tyson. So mm -hmm. Jewel, whose family is very poor and really struggling um, in this very struggling area, gets the idea to create a new type of company in which previously there was a feed dealer and there was someone hatching the chicks and there was someone hauling the chicks and there was someone slaughtering the chicks and there was mm. someone packaging the chickens and selling them. He puts all of those into one company <laughs> vertically and he Great becomes, <laughs> he becomes the person, the company who um, uh, buys the grains, owns the mill, mills the feed, brings it to farmers, hatches the eggs, takes the chick to farm, chicks to farmers, collects them when they're done, which is not very long after, brings mm -hmm. them to a slaughterhouse, owns the slaughterhouse, slaughters the chickens, packages the chickens, distributes the chickens, and negotiates the contracts with the yeah. points of sale. All that's left to the farmers in a kind of sharecropping in animals yeah. is the land, the buildings, the debt, yes. let's put up the buildings, right. and the manure. So and the manure will be, later becomes very important in our story. A, a good business model for Jewel, <laughs> not so good for the chicken farmers yet. It, Correct. It's not going to go that well. Right. For them, and, and actually, there had to be a shift for uh, the general public to start buying chicken. 
And during so, this time when you were talking about that, I learned a new word, acronized. I'm like, isn't this bizarre? The story. I don't know this word. The ever. story of acronizing, <laughs> although it horrifies me so much. Yes, yeah, yeah, so, horrifying. No so there's all kinds of things that that are, you know, all of these these effects are sort of rolling over each other. Um, <laughs> so before we talk about, uh, the, so the, the thing that I want to say is that's really persistent in this story that um, actually someone who was interviewing me pointed out, and um, it was such a revelation. <laughs> it was Dina Shanker of uh, Bloomberg, and I'm so grateful to her for thinking of this. There's a whole bunch of points in the story of chickens becoming chicken, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where supply gets out in front of demand, and yeah. the industry has to figure out how to stimulate demand. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so. Um, so Jukes is one of those moments when he organizes chicken so that in such a, sorry, Jukes is one of those moments when he makes chicken faster to produce with his right. promoter antibiotics. But nobody Jewel wants is one. a chicken. <clears throat> Jewel is one when he, um, he reorganizes the industry to be more efficient. Um, the chicken of tomorrow contest is I, 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 Yes. <laughs> I love which the chicken is, of tomorrow. I, I mean, I can't oh. even say that out loud without laughing. It sounds like something out of <laughs> yeah. the Jetsons, right? It is, but exactly. In 1948 and 1951. Almost the, almost the era of fairs with perfect, beautiful baby contests and right, exactly. perfect family contests. So there's still there's a social context for this. So the, the USDA and the uh, A&P supermarkets mm -hmm. um, sponsor a contest, <laughs> the, the goal of which is to create a chicken that more people want to eat. Mm -hmm. um, well, because chickens are still primarily more adapted to egg laying than they are to being mm -hmm. meat chickens. And so what they want, they say in the, in the early documents that um, they want a chicken with a breast that slices like a steak. And so they encourage breeders from around the country, both hobbyists and professional breeders, to come up with a hybridized chicken Mm -hmm. This is really the beginning of the, the sort of what I think of as the triumph of the hybrids over the heritage yeah. and standard breads that really has the, the kind of chicken that would look familiar to us today, which is has a very big pouty breast because in the United States we really like white meat that is much more docile, that is much less inclined to exercise, mm -hmm. that probably doesn't need as much immune protection because we're going to start putting them into, into closed barns. And they can, these tinkerers and breeders completely transform the modern into chickens into what we think of as the modern broiler and to this day most of the chickens that are produced in industrial scale production are descended from the chickens that won the chicken of tomorrow contest so now suddenly we've got a chicken that more people want to eat and that's where acronizing this amazing story <laughs> enters the picture so oh. so the, the question now is, now that we've got this tasty chicken, how do you get it to more people? Well, chicken's a raw food, it's a, mm -hmm. and it spoils easily. It's already being, being fed lots of antibiotics, um, thanks to Jukes' invention. Um, and and this, it's actually Jukes' company who are primarily originally responsible for this. They get an idea to do one more sale of their antibiotics, yeah. and it's after the chick, not having having been fed them throughout their lives, the chickens now get one more dose of antibiotics after they're dead. They are slaughtered, they're cut apart, or at least plucked, so they're like whole, but you know, but ready to cook. And then they get dipped in a solution of chlortetracycline <laughs> and packaged. And the industry was incredibly proud of this, that you would now have raw chicken or fish, it was routine for both of those protein foods, that could last in a grocer's cold case for weeks, weeks. instead of for days. <laughs> because the antibiotic kept down the development of spoilage bacteria yeah. on the surface of the meat. And Stays that nobody longer. thought, yeah. that everyone thought this was a fantastic idea. In fact, yeah. so fantastic that at first they tried, um, they tried pumping antibiotics into animals before they were killed. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> especially for pigs and for, for yes. pigs and cattle. But they they decided first that it was too unpredictable because it it um, uh, it wouldn't perfuse evenly, and mm -hmm. they couldn't get the cattle to stay still long enough. Um, <laughs> but also that it was like too they, they were using too much antibiotic by um, and they could save antibiotic if they just took the animal apart and dipped it afterward. <laughs> and it's not until the mid nineteen sixties when uh, a suspicion of all food additives starts mm -hmm. to rise for a number of reasons because of the the um, publication of Silent Spring, the uh, mm -hmm. discovery of um, 
uh, of uterine cancers linked to diethyl stilbestrol, which is being given to cattle as a growth hormone. Um, uh, arguments over saccharin and, and other artificial sweeteners um, that, that people start to turn against acronizing. But for 10 years, acronizing was a thing that everyone was incredibly proud of. I have a whole bunch of advertisements like that I Simonizing bought off EV. Yes, exactly. The company, literally, actually, and then and Pfizer also had a similar process a little later on. Um, mm. They ran a very sophisticated advertising campaign. They, they hired a Madison Avenue Mad Men style ad company to uh, ad agency to, to advertise acronizing. And there are these beautiful um, magazine ads with very, very aspirational looking displays of dinner um, and gorgeous, gorgeous chickens. And they all say something like, your chicken is fresh and country sweet and there's, and it's acronized. And there's this suggestion that, you know, this is more sort of like technology is an un unqualified good. And mm -hmm. they never say in the ads that it's antibiotics. And, and individual grocers, I mean, I have all these ads from old newspapers, uh, the kind of ads that used to run like a, on a quarter of a newspaper yeah. page. And they have little pen and ink keeps. drawings. Yeah, p yeah, little pen and ink drawings of the, you know, ham on special this week. We have pineapples now, things yeah. like that. And then it would say, and our chicken is acronized. Yes. <laughs> but already then, there are the seeds. I mean, we have several seeds of things that are going to go go wrong without bad intentions. But I, thinking about, you know, today, uh, one of the big evil giants is Monsanto and their problems with you have to use our seed and forever you're going to use their seed. And I'm thinking the consequence of becoming to rely on the chicken of tomorrow type hybrids is that people who are locked into those hybrids have to keep getting their hens from the people who are doing the breeding using secret and changing processes of birds to hybridize in order to keep the product having similar uh, continuing uh, characteristics, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, modern modern chickens and turkeys are like modern hybrid seeds. Yeah. Um, they don't. They if they can mate at all, they don't breed yeah. true. So to yeah. keep the to keep having a consistent supply of chickens that grow to the, at the same speed, to the same weight, with the same conformation, you have to keep going back and back and back to the owners of the intellectual property. Mm -hmm. All of the broiler types that are grown in the world today belong to two companies. Mm -hmm. Now, two a, companies. a brief pause here. We still have a, a few more steps of good intentions leading to bad things and then nasty discoveries. And a lot of people, We'll come to this book perhaps with the, my God, what have we done with antibiotic resistance? And about at this point, I think I was, I was telling a friend about this, and he's like, I don't even want to read that book. You know, it's just too depressing. He knows what's going on. I was like, by the time I got to the end of the book, so here's a little bit of foreshadowing that says, you know what? I was delighted the book ended for me very optimistically. So there's good yet to come, but we have some more horrors to go through first, right? I, I think of it as a story that goes to some really dark places, but ends up uh, in a kind of positive place. I mean, we're, right. we're still in a sort of like, keep watching the skies kind of moment. No, no. It's, yeah. not, uh, it's not as bad as it could be. So um, actually, um, let's see. Should we talk about the bad stuff or the good stuff? I love the <laughs> chapter where you were in France. Oh, and this is another making, good stuff chapter. They okay, were so making great so the first third, oh. first third of the book is is the the history. The the medium third of the, mm -hmm. the, the like the center of the book is uh, all the bad stuff that unspooled from yeah. um, from using antibiotics in chickens and the ways in which chicken taught the rest of animal agriculture to use antibiotics as growth mm -hmm. promoters, mm -hmm. as preventive drugs, and and boosted this vast epidemic of drug resistant infections around the world. The last third of the book is kind of the solutions piece. Mm -hmm. So I go to different places where poultry production has been changed in various ways that is is antibiotic free, that is economically viable, but that looks different. So um, I go to some very high throughput robotic farms in the mm -hmm. Netherlands for, um, that have accommodated incredibly deep cuts in antibiotic use by um, making a number of changes in their raising. And then I go to these adorable farms in the southwest of France um, where, chi where chickens of a, a type that are a hybrid 
um, that are owned, that come from those same two companies, but that to our eyes would look like a heritage chicken. They're, mm -hmm. they're upright, they're slender, they have colored feathers. Their distinctive thing is they have a, they call them uh, kunu, naked neck. Um, mm -hmm. They have no feathers from where their ears would be down to the, the top of their necks. Um, and they are raised in very small sheds mm -hmm. and allowed to roam freely in pine forests during the day. And they're incredibly sturdy and they, you know, flap up into the trees and mm -hmm. they eat their own bugs and so forth. And they naturally return to their shelters at night. And these chickens, this chicken mode of chicken production is protected by the French government under a seal that in French uh, is called the red label. Mm -hmm. And they are, they are the Sunday lunch chicken of France for the, the big meal in which all the family comes together at the end or, or beginning of the week. Um, are, and no one would not, no one would roast anything but a La Belle Rouge chicken. People are designing <clears throat> these farm experiments based <clears throat> on new understanding and some of the problems that we perceive. So they're, <clears throat> they're not, uh, they're not haphazard, I would say. It seemed like they're understanding how to separate the chickens, how to reduce certain things, how to keep them healthy, how to, I, you quote somebody, and I neglected to write down who it was late on in the book. You said, to remove antibiotics is not to ruin intensive agriculture. It is to bring intensive agriculture to a place where animal welfare becomes part of the business model. I think that's me, actually. <laughs> I don't think that's yeah, quoting, quoting you saying that, and that's, that's a very that's a very important idea. Uh, that that no, this is not out to get intensive farming as such. We understand that there are issues about trying to feed people who come to rely on chicken as their protein, but we have what had turned into a, an uh, unsustainable model that scaled too big. Is there a way to change that that can still be practical? And you show us at least hints, if not the total solution that says, yes, there are answers. Yes, this can be done. And you know, it may turn out better than it was before. So the interesting thing is, so we've kind of leapfrogged again over all the bad yeah. stuff to the to the, the happier ending. Um, a <laughs> number of companies led by the chicken company Purdue, which is the fourth largest company in, chicken company in the U.S. and still family owned, um, run by the grandson of the founder. They in 2014 turned away, turned against antibiotic mm -hmm. use and um, really shocked uh, the, and somewhat angered the rest of their industry by doing that. That is a real surprise, isn't it? And, it is a real surprise. They, yeah. they didn't use it as a marketing tool yet either then, did they? They, um, they, it's on all their the labels. I mean, I think now they may be putting that in their now ads, they but they did yeah. it initially. They did it because consumers were asking for it. They stay in very close touch with their mm -hmm. customers. Um, so what was I going to say about that? So what Purdue has found is that once you take antibiotics out of the mix, you have to go back to doing, with, within you know, very modern, very large, very high throughput mm -hmm. farming, you have to go back to doing some of the things that farmers used to do because it is those things that support birds immune systems mm -hmm. in such a way as to make antibiotics not necessary mm -hmm. like they the, the company changed the diet to a much higher quality diet so that like no rendered protein from other slaughtered animals was part of it um, they give the birds uh, er herbs and supplements and metal salts and essential oils and so forth that have a sterilizing effect on gut bacteria but don't provoke resistance. They give them many more vaccines. But they also give them more space in the barns so they're not crowded in quite so tight, um, which is a disease risk. They allow them to exercise. They put things in the barns. I've seen this. I've been in their barns multiple times. Uh, they give them things like straw bales mm -hmm. and um, wood pallets that are propped up, kind of like ladders for them to walk on and flap up, and um, swings. They also put some swings in the barn. And the swings are actually disguised. Um, they're, they are both uh, uh, scales for weighing the chickens. Oh. And they're all, but they also have some sensors in them that allow them to figure out like how much the chickens are exercising, because the 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 pressure plates record how many times the chicken jumps mm -hmm. on and off. <laughs> um, and they've also put put the big the most noticeable thing is that they have cut windows in the yeah. walls of their barns, which were were you know industry standard in the United States is to have a solid metal wall. Mm -hmm. So all those things, different diet, um, exposure to sunlight. Uh, you know, endogenous vitamin D production, exercise, um, um, uh, more um, ability, you know, just sort of like more comfortable living, those support the immune system 
in a way that makes antibiotics le less necessary. There are also the things that would have been present in chicken raising back when it was a backyard thing. Now, not every company is going that way. It's really fascinating to me that some other companies are, are like, if you could say that some, some of them are taking the French model of being um, going more toward the practices of the small scale while mm. maintaining an industrial size. Some are going toward the Dutch model of being very hands-off, roboticized raising on mm. the theory that what transmits the most disease to chickens is handling yeah. by people. So if you reduce mm -hmm. human handling, and there are some barn prototypes that I've been in, in which the birds are, are only touched once between, um, they're not touched until before, the, the, until they're, they're touched in the shell, and then mm -hmm. they're not touched again until the day they're killed. Mm -hmm. And all the rest of their um, hatching and raising and feeding is all done robotically, right to the, to the day when the, the surface on which they're growing starts to move and it turns out that it's a conveyor belt and it carries yes. them to the end of the barn and drops <laughs> them into the crates <clears throat> that will be driven to the slaughterhouse. Yeah, so. But you make, you make a point that goes by quickly <clears throat> but would encourage a lot of people reading this that the, the big change at Purdue is basically customer driven. It was completely customer driven and this is really a fascinating part of the story I think and it's one of the things that makes this uh, you know as, as dire as antibiotic resistance is, and we can talk about mm -hmm. that. The, the, the good news in this story is that consumer pressure really caused this change. Now, mm -hmm. Europe controlled antibiotic use in agriculture more than 10 years ago, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with mixed results, mostly positive. There are some, some spots where people like skate by the rules, but the United States first attempted farm antibiotic control in 1977, lost out thanks to political pressure, held it at bay, the industry held it at bay for more than 30 years. And, and then yeah. both the companies turned over, but also the Obama administration made it possible mm -hmm. for companies to act. And I really believe that what's behind both of those phenomena is that a consumer movement was growing mm -hmm. that insisted on antibiotic free meat and made it safe for both the government to move and for the companies to respond. I wrote down another horrifying quotation from just about this point where you're talking about 1976, Donald Kennedy's big push to do something about antibiotic resistance. The, the industry uh, is in an uproar and you quote, let me see who it was, a representative of American cyanamid <laughs> as saying, there are no widespread epidemics of untreatable diseases among humans because of antibiotics and livestock feeds. Apparently he's fine until there's an uncontrollable epide epidemic of antibiotic resistance. It's like, really it has to get that bad before he's willing to, well, not willing, he's never gonna be willing maybe, but I, I, I don't know, it's just, it's just like, well, I don't see what the problem is. There's not been a major e epidemic yet. <clears throat> There was a lot of, I don't see what the problem is. For, yeah. In fact, if you, you know, if you know public health history, which not very many people do, maybe that's right. a bit of a niche issue, but um, the, the arguments in favor of maintaining animal antibiotic use over the years sound more and more like the arguments for continuing right. to sell tobacco. Yeah. It's the same language over and over again. Nor, no clear effect, more research needed. Over and rinse, repeat. Toxic chemicals, uh, anthropogenic climate change, whichever has a large industry behind it, right? But there are these currents, and why why would you read Big Chicken for its, you know, horrifying indictment of an industry gone evil, uh, if not for all of the, the last third of the book, all of these currents of things to say, no, there's there are hopeful ways out there, things that can be done, the consumer does have some power. Um, I don't know. I was sort of overwhelmed almost emotionally by, by reading these oh, uh, different wonderful. solutions at the end of, of people trying different things, of having some successes, of, of finding uh, some acceptance that allows them to grow a little bit, and that these, these sound like things that could, could perhaps lead us back to sanity. Uh, that's a very I hope so, journey. although, you know, as much as I think this is a um, this is a story that that ends in a relatively positive place. There really is a keep watching the skies moment oh, yeah. at, at the yeah, end of that. Too. And that is that we are talking about having ameliorated the problem of overuse of antibiotics in agriculture just in Western Europe and North America. Mm -hmm. right. There's a whole lot of the rest of the world mm -hmm. out there China, in which yeah. the, uh, you know, the, the economies of the developing world 
China, India, Brazil, yeah. Thailand, Vietnam, are growing. And one of the most reliable signs of a rising economy is that its residents, citizens, start to buy more meat. Because yeah. we love meat, we're hardwired to eat it. And so with those enormous populations, billions of people wanting to eat more meat, where's that meat gonna come from? It's mm -hmm. gonna come from the Western style factory farms that we created. And so, yeah, so we have that ever present complaint. It's like, oh fine, you've, you've, done, you've done your growth, you've ruined everything, and who are you to tell us, we don't get to grow our economy now. Right, right. It's exact. I mean, to me, it's very like the arguments over climate change in which sure. you know, the West, the developed West says to the global South, you know how we had those big shiny Chevys yes. and all those refrigerators? Don't do like we did. And the, and the global South says, wait, yeah. you want gas guzzlers yeah, too. Yes. You know, and it's the same thing. Like we're saying, you know, we, we created this, this unsustainable farming system that, that produced those big juicy steaks. Please skip that, that moment in your evolution. And they're like, no, we want our yes. steaks. Yes. Who are you to tell us we don't get to have steaks? So well, maybe we can. The question maybe of, we can. Are, are the, maybe we can. The question of are those are these new models of livestock production with that forego antibiotics, are they going to be allowed to propagate into the developing world? D to the different degrees, different countries are, are working on this. I am more reassured about China where they yeah. ha recently had a very bad superbug scare because yeah. of agricultural production. Um, they are making some moves from the central government level to ameliorate some of their antibiotic use. I'm very worried about India, which is much more decentralized right. and where um, you can buy just about any antibiotic in the world yeah. over the counter anytime you want. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I want to um, shift gears just a little bit. So this book and Superbug, you have stories of people who got sick. And Consider. you tell those stories so well. And, you know, and, and for some reason, we're all drawn to these stories. So uh, do you find this to be an easy thing to write about, a hard thing to write about? Do you find it a necessary thing to include? Yeah, thank you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Talking about I mean, I, communicating I science to the are, general public. They're right? not, <clears throat> it's not easy to find um, stories of, uh, to find victims whose stories sort of work well enough narratively that you want to elevate them. Um, in, in, you know, in a book like this to, so that lots of people will read them. They're hard things to research and to write because you're coming face to face with profound human suffering. You know, in my book, Superbug, there are a lot of dead children in that book. Yes, and and yes. I had a lot of conversations with the families of people who's, you know, families of victims who did not survive drug resistant infections. The guy who starts this book, um, whose, whose patient story is, is at the front of chapter one, he does survive a, a, a devastating drug-resistant foodborne infection, yeah. but um, he is profoundly changed by it, and he's been left with lifelong sequelae as a result. And mm -hmm. I, I tell his story both because it was an exquisitely well-documented and legally confirmed story, but also because um, uh, he is not extraordinary. He is very, I mean, he's a wonderful man, but he is very representative of thousands and thousands of people to whom this happens to in the United States every day. Mm -hmm. He himself was part of an outbreak of more than 600 people with identified illness in 30 states and territories. The CDC's multiplier for most foodborne illnesses, if you know of one case, there's probably 30 that were never diagnosed. Yeah. So there were thousands of people in that outbreak that went on for more than a year. Yeah, it's it's amazing. So these these stories though seem important to put in. They are important, these books. but because because the whole this is the reason why you know that. <clears throat> so I haven't made this explicit, I think, but the whole reason behind why we should care about antibiotic use in agriculture is not just because it created modern high throughput farming that devalues mm -hmm. animal welfare and and um, may reduce the nutrition in our food and causes vast you know amounts of environmental pollution we care about it most or we should because most of the drugs that are used in animal agriculture are the same ones that are used in human medicine so bacteria are exposed to those drugs in the in the anim the systems of the animals those bacteria become resistant. They migrate away from the farm uh, through a variety of pathways. At some point, they cause a human infection that cannot be cured because the drug that would be used to cure it has already been used to create that bacteria inadvertently on the farm. So 
you know, antibiotic resistance is, as you, you mentioned, as this, the UN said last year, is a global peril. 700,000 people a year currently die of antibiotic resistance, 23,000 in the United States. In the United States, 2 million people a year see a doctor because of a resistant infection. If we don't get antibiotic resistance under control, the prediction is the death rate in just a few decades will be 10 million people. So uh, now, antibiotic, uh, Agriculture is not solely responsible for this. Right. Medicine also misuses and overuses mm -hmm. antibiotics. And, but the only way we slow this down is for all, for all of the realms in which antibiotics are overused to dial back their use, to slow down bacterial evolution. Because resistance is such a problem that pharma companies are not motivated to make antibiotics anymore. So there is no cavalry in the form of a new drug coming along to save us. We have to deal with the drugs that we have. And the only way we protect them is by reducing their misuse. And it, it sounds and shrill <laughs> because we've, we've had long enough to forget the, the horrifying things that people died of before penicillin that they don't anymore, that we think of as minor problems. Yeah, so I think, you know, as, as is on, this, this point is often made about vaccine preventable diseases, that most people in the United States have never seen a case of smolio, polio, a case of smallpox, a case of tetanus, a case of diphtheria. They have no idea how bad those diseases prevented by vaccines are, and so they devalue vaccines. Similarly, we were all born within the antibiotic era. Yeah. which, you know, in, in its earliest incarnation starts in 1928 when Alexander Fleming leaves a window open in his London laboratory and something blows in and contaminates his plates of staph bacteria and that thing turns out to be penicillium mold from which they get the first natural penicillin. So none of us know what it was like, except though if you, you know, like remember your grandmother being obsessional about you washing your hands and scrubbing mm -hmm. the floor and so forth, that's an indication of what it was like. My own great uncle, um, I only found out this story after starting to research this book, died of septic shock in 1938, that's mm -hmm. three years before the first human test of penicillin, when um, a, a chunk of metal in a firehouse in Manhattan fell off a shelf and like bumped him, bruised him and scratched him and um, he was gravely ill. The only treatment they could offer him, aside from aspirin and cold compresses, was the men from his firehouse lined up to donate blood because they mm -hmm. thought if they gave him transfusions they could literally dilute his oh, blood poisoning. Wow. And mm -hmm. it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And he died. Oh my goodness, um, I never heard of such a thing. <laughs> That first person, I couldn't believe, when I read it in his, it's in his obituary from the tiny paper outside New York where he was memorialized and I had never heard of this either. I couldn't stand it. Um, the first person to get penicillin experimentally, um, a British uh, constable, Constable Alexander. He went out into his garden and scratched his face on a rose bush. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he was so gravely ill that his, you know, his, all his wounds leaked pus and they had to take one of his eyes out. And penicillin almost saved him. And then they had so little drug that the, even though they were like extracting it out of his urine, the drug ran out and he died. Yeah, he died. So that's where we're going. If we don't conserve antibiotics, we are going back to an era in which, you know, um, people get, get strep throat and end up with rheumatic heart fever yeah. and, uh, you know, get a high fever and their children are deaf and can't have open cavity surgery. And, and, you know, therefore no cesarean sections and um, pneumonia takes three people out of every 10. Yeah. Uh, this is not, we do not want to go back to the antibiotic era and the pre-antibiotic era. And we are quivering on the edge of it. Every single infectious disease doctor I know has at some point seen a case in which yeah. they had nothing left to give. Nothing to do. Yeah. You, know, and, um, you know, this summer, my mother got pneumonia mm -hmm. with a UTI and sepsis. And like they threw the whole lot at her. And I, in my head, I just kept thinking of, well, what about <laughs> resistance? What about resistance? <laughs> you know, I'm freaking out, you know. Um, and she was very, very ill. Um, actually, speaking of UTI, uh, I didn't know. Wow, what a revelation in the book. Like this UTIs coming in, young women that they were saying, right. blaming on, well, too much well, sexual activity. So this is a very active area of, I think the story is fascinating and it's yeah, such an I active have no area idea. of right now. <laughs> the, um, you know, we tend to, I think, you know, if people think about the whole antibiotic 
in antibiotic use in agriculture problem, they kind of intuitively go to foodborne illness. So salmonella, which is what the, the chap we were just discussing, my, my victim at the beginning of the book, Campylobacter, Shigella, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Things that go into and come out of our guts. Yeah. But there's this other very large, very <laughs> large suspected epidemic for which the trail of evidence back to the farm is much longer and thinner. Um, so that even for those big outbreaks, you know, the evidence is so, so distributed geographically and so removed in time from the original antibiotic use that it's sometimes quite challenging to chase the, trace the chain of evidence back. These UTIs make it even more difficult. So what happens is um, the, the, the research is starting to show that there are resistant bacteria on meat that come from the guts of the animal who received the antibiotic when the animal's disassembled, some of the gut contents get on the meat and travel with the meat into a home or a restaurant kitchen. If you do not run your kitchen, like a laboratory, the chances are you will contaminate. You'll either won't cook it, cook the meat perfectly, or you'll contaminate another food or a cooking surface. Right. Um, so under normal circumstances, then we consume those, they get into our, into our guts, and they cause a foodborne infection that's resistant. But sometimes, particularly for women because of our anatomy, they go out the gut and they get into the urinary system, which mean, which uh, produces a resistant urinary tract infection, which if it goes untreated or is treated with drugs to which it is resistant, then climb up to the kidneys from which they, it gets into the circulatory system, which can cause pneumonia, um, can cause septic shock. And according to the estimate of the, probably the leading researcher on this in the US, uh, who's Lance Price of GW, is probably responsible for six to ten percent of the UTIs in the mm. United States each year. Well, there are six to eight million UTIs in the U.S. each so year. So lot. this could potentially be responsible for six hundred thousand cases of resistant illness each year. That is just, and the the scientific understanding of how that's happening and the, the epidemiology of it is just now being defined. It's mind-boggling. I'm so yeah. glad you put that in the book because I had mm -hmm. no idea and I was under the same impression thinking of foodborne illnesses and things like that. It was just remarkable, remarkable. Yeah, it is. I was reading about, uh, you, you were describing uh, an outbreak of salmonella in Minnesota and a, a, a scientist, an investigator named Holmberg uh, in 1983. And it was a resistant salmonella. And I was reading it. I made a note after I read that uh, that story about how I read what you said there and the chain of reasoning that he went through as a scientist. And I thought his investigation was remarkable and, and his conclusions were, were undeniable. And then it struck me that a lot of people hearing that story would not think it. It, it, it would strike conspiracy theorists and many people as uh, just a bunch of smoke and they made the whole thing up and you can't even, uh, there wasn't even an epidemic. Uh, and so the, the whole question became one of communication and how do you communicate authoritatively to people who maybe are disinclined to believe or think the connections are tenuous or something? One, you know, it may be a rhetorical question because your book does a very good job of here are the dots, here are more dots, here are lots more dots, and you draw so many of these lines that I don't see how you could miss it. But it's it's hard to be convincing. What are you thinking as you're telling these stories? Yeah, so, how do you convince um, I mean, people? These, uh, so this is why, for, for, you know, this is precisely why my books are so narrative, why they are so focused on the experience of individual victims, mm -hmm. and why they are, um, why I work so hard to be very cinematic in my telling of these stories mm -hmm. is because narrative is how people make sense of things. You know, mm -hmm. I, I could talk for hours and probably would if given the chance about the dangers of <laughs> antibiotic resistance and, mm -hmm. and the process by which um, antibiotic resistance enters the world. But that's all pretty wonky. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily make sense to the average member of the, you know, sort of my mass reading audience who may not stand still while I recite for hours all mm -hmm. the statistics about <laughs> antibiotic resistance. But people will listen to the story of a child who dies in six hours mm -hmm. of, of necrotizing pneumonia from MRSA yeah. or an athlete whose career is ruined or a guy who is left with lifelong arthritis because he had a case of salmonella or as in the, the outbreak you just referred to, 
a man who dies mm -hmm. um, because he's had he's in the hospital because of a farming accident and he has the bad luck to go into the the colonoscopy suite where they're going to where they're going to like check for any internal bleeding and so forth a immediately after one of the victims of this food resistant foodborne outbreak and some of her resistant infection has contaminated the scope that they use on him yeah. so his illness the last death the, the death and the last illness in that outbreak in 1983 uh, and 84 was um, was a, it was a hospital mistake it was a hospital caused infection yeah. but the original right. infection was dated back to the you traced back to the use of antibiotics yeah. Yeah. in this herd of cattle in the upper midwest but you get high marks from those of us that read science for including the wonkiness in the story that's that's the thing we we disparage people for is for like leaving out the names of the bacteria and leaving out various details that really are required to support the story. I try so, not to hand wave. Yeah. I try not to do just sort of like, yes. you know, Bringing those together and, and, then, so and then a difficult thing happened. Let us go on to the next uh, narrative episode. I, you know, right. it's try, yeah. try, always trying to figure out how much science is too much and how much is not enough is kind of a difficult thing. Well, I think that's so thank you for so appreciating it. And enjoyed it so much is because the stories were so compelling and you didn't try to get around the scientific wonky parts. Thank you. Right. 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 Nice right. And, and even, you know, here you've got a biologist and I get to talk about resistance all the time mm -hmm. to my students. And okay. then you've got Jeff, who's a physicist. But, you know, you know, so if he's giving you high marks for a good balance, then that's there good. Because go. I, I read the biology and just go, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both. Yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic. So, Maren, we've only got a couple minutes left. Um, did we forget to ask you something? Or is there anything else you'd like to add before we, we sign off? Um, so uh, people ask me, you know, if there's a takeaway to this, and aside from that, that we should always anticipate unintended consequences, yeah. <laughs> is that I really want people to know that, um, that though this problem is not solved, that individual people really have a lot of power. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. And I think the story of, of the transformation of chicken production because of, of uh, antibiotics really demonstrates that you know this in the United States this did not this transformation didn't really happen because of regulation though regulation happened mm -hmm. it happened because consumers rose up and insisted on change mm -hmm. and companies and the government responded and so people can you know we get to vote with uh, on what we're going to eat on our food system three times a day with the money that we spend so people should I hope that people will go to their stores and look for antibiotic free meat raised without antibiotics no antibiotics ever if they can afford it to to support small and medium-sized producers is amazing because those are the aspirational models that the mm. rest of meat production is is reconsidering they couldn't compete just on cost but when antibiotic free becomes a value they can compete yeah. um, so this may encourage more small farmers um, back toward meat production again um, but most of all just remember that you know, people who have who seem individually to have not much power, parents and um, farmers and scientists and uh, lunch ladies, you know, when they get together, they can change the world. Wow. Well, everybody, we've been talking with Maren McKenna about her remarkable book, Big Chicken. And if you have not read Superbug, I suggest that one as well. Um, she's a great writer and we're now you don't have a regular blog anymore or do you and I've just um, I do not uh, okay. I, yeah, I'm, I'm no longer the uh, con contribution situation at National Geographic changed but I okay. hope uh, I'm in the midst of a very lengthy and painful um, and granular reorganization of my website and okay. when that's done I may have a blog again okay. um, and people can but people can read more at big chicken the book dot com okay. and Marin McKenna dot com Great, great. Thank you, Marin, for coming. Oh, thank you both for having so, me. Oh, I loved your book. We we thank both you. were talking about how much we loved it. So it's fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody, see you again next time on Read Science. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs>